An example of conviction that's fairly well known is from 1997, Timothy McVeigh, remember Timothy McVeigh? Yeah, infamous, was convicted for his part in the 1995 bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building. Not that long ago for some of us, doesn't seem too long ago. After sifting through 22 days of testimony from 160 witnesses, jurors found McVeigh guilty on all 11 counts of his federal indictment. Let's just, I just want to throw out a sample of a well-known conviction to get, us, get the gears going here today. I want to talk today about conviction. Uh, but first, I want to review last week. <laughs> I, ha I had a good response last week, so I thought I should redo that a little bit. Um, anyway, it's just, it, it isn't so much that, it's just that that is really important to me, what, what I was seeking to convey last week. I call, I'm calling last Sunday, the, the Sunday before Pentecost, the 10-day gap Sunday. And uh, so it's this 10 days between the ascension of Jesus when he goes up and the Pe uh, Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes down. So there's this 10-day gap and what goes on during that time? The disciples were told by Jesus to hang out in Jerusalem. They're mostly from Galilee, if not all the disciples. There's 120 of them anyway, gathered, gathered together, kind of hanging out for 10 days. And, you know, they don't really know what to expect. And so what does it say they do? I mean, there's a bunch of things I talked about, but mainly they prayed for 10 days. They prayed for 10 days. <laughs> Hard to pray for like more than two minutes, right? 10 days, good golly. So, so they prayed for 10 days, and you know why? I mean, Jesus did say, the Holy Spirit's gonna show up, and then you're going to be my witnesses all over the place, here, Judea, Samaria, Samaria and the ends of the world. And that might have just been a little bit scary, <laughs> seeing as how Jesus had just got killed for that kind of stuff, right? Telling the good news to people. Uh, and so I'm guessing they were a little scared, and they were a little excited, and they didn't know what to expect, and they were, had nothing much else to do because they weren't home. <laughs> And so, anyway, they prayed for 10 days. And that's, that's pretty amazing. My belief is that, you know, if we want to see God at work in people's lives, in our own lives, in our churches, if we want to see people coming to faith in Jesus Christ again, I mean, we, you may have noticed that the church is very much in decline in the West. Churches used to be filled not so much at all uh, across the board. And, you know, we, that's our biggest, probably our biggest Sunday school of the year. Lots of weeks we don't have anybody. Or we have one or two. And that's common. Lots of churches don't even have a Sunday school. that used to have massive Sunday schools, like, you know, not that many years ago, a few decades ago. And all that's a sign of something going on in our society. And we could think that, and we've tried this all through the West. Um, <clears throat> we've tried to, you know, to get better, more eloquent, uh, more highly trained preachers. And we've, it, you can do that. We've, we've, you know, we've worked on better, higher level quality, fresher music. We got all kinds of technology and we've seen how that works. <laughs> that, that mixed blessing that it is. Um, you know, and all kinds of programming, we can put that in place and people have, there's all kinds of wonderful things. And all those things are great, they may help. But at the end of the day, nothing changes unless God moves. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. So, uh, to me, my heart is that we need to uh, kind of communally and uh, together to be praying for renewal and for revival and for a visitation of the Holy Spirit in our day. It may or may not come, but if we don't ask, <laughs> I mean, we're called upon to ask. That's what the disciples did, and he showed up in power. So, to me, that's, that's in a sense, that's all, I mean, we can do these other things, but the main thing we need to be doing, and we can all do it. We can't all preach, we can't all you know, do music, we can't all run programs or whatever, but we can all pray. And that's the main key thing that needs to happen, to pray for revival and renewal in our day. Um, so let, let's hope and pray for that. And when, when the Holy Spirit does show up, that's, what, that, that's common terminology. If you go to a Pentecostal church, they say, we're going to see if God shows up today. <laughs> so when the Holy Spirit shows up, it can be pretty darn exciting. And so a case in point is the day of Pentecost. So you may have just listened to that reading, which, uh, which Lisa did. On the day of Pentecost, they didn't know what to expect. So they're all together in one place. It says, first of all, there's this big, powerful sound. It sounds like a rushing mighty wind. So I can't help but think of, you know, we hear today, I don't know if you've been in a tornado, but when a tornado comes through, it's like a, a freight train is running through your house. <laughs> it's the sound of a mushing, rushing mighty wind. So there's this powerful sound uh, they look around and each one of them's got little tongues of fire 
kind of dancing around on the tops of their heads or over their heads. And then they all start to speak in languages that they don't know. And then people start to gather around and say, what the heck's going on? Are they drunk? Because <laughs> they're having such a good time, obviously. It's kind of a party atmosphere. And they say, well, what's going on? They're, they're, they're praising God in our languages. And they're just like, you know, Galileans. How's this work out? So, uh, so, so th that kind of thing we, we could expect. I mean, when revivals have happened, and they haven't happened for a long time. I think it's been really over 100 years since we've seen real revival happen in the West. And we, we're, we're like a dry and thirsty land, folks. So that's what we need to be praying about. We need to look and, 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 and pray for that. Now, also, it's, it's not just this dramatic kind of extraordinary things that we might expect to happen, but when the Holy Spirit shows up, and you'll know this if the Holy Spirit's showing up in your own life, <laughs> some of the, his signs are things like, like peace that you can't explain. You know, a peace, the scripture says, that passes understanding. You just have this deep inexplicable peace. And joy, joy is a sign of the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's joy unspeakable and full of glory and the half has never yet been told. You know, you know that your, Jesus and the, the disciples say, we write this to you that your joy may be full. That's why we're always singing. Because at heart, Christians that have been touched by Christ and by the Holy Spirit are full of joy. And the, kind of the best way to kind of let it out is, is in song. And most importantly, of course, is love. The Holy Spirit's presence always brings love and deeper love. Um, uh, Romans 5, it says, uh, the early verses of Romans chapter 5, it says, um, he talks about the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit that God has given to us. Galatians 5, um, <clears throat> if, you're, if you're ripping through my Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is, like, the, here's what happens when, the, when the, the Holy Spirit's in your life. The fruit of the Spirit is, Love, then joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self control all those others. But the first one up is, is love. Jan already mentioned the royal wedding. How many actually saw the royal wedding? Or, or parts of it, or reruns of it, or whatever. <laughs> it just ran all day yesterday. And, uh, you know, Bishop Michael Curry was the Episcopal bishop, American Episcopal bishop, that came in and did the homily for, for, the, for the wedding. Nice 14-minute sermon. Whew. Got a lot to learn, but anyway. <laughs> he talked about love. That's what he talked about the whole way through. Well, he talked about fire first. He talked about fire quite a bit. And, uh, uh, and that's interesting because I think he, he was implying Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. Because he didn't say anything about Pentecost or the Holy Spirit. But it is Pentecost weekend and he's an Episcopal bishop. So he's got that in his mind. So he talks about fire and then he talks a ton about love. And he quotes all kinds of people about love. And he says this, imagine our homes and families where love is the way. Imagine our neighborhoods and communities where love is the way. Imagine our governments and nations where love is the way. Imagine business and commerce <laughs> where love is the way. Imagine this tired old world where love is the way. And he goes on. I, I kind of wondered if he was just a little bit thinking of uh, John Lennon's song, because he kept saying, imagine, right? Imagine, that famous, and imagine all the people living for today, living life in peace, you know? Uh, I think he's kind of uh, reflecting that a little bit. So what, what a great vision. But you know what? That will only happen. It can happen. It will only happen when the Holy Spirit falls afresh again upon our world. Only then, it's the, only the gift of God, the grace of God, that people will, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a great vision and a great hope, but it's only by God's power and His grace, by the Holy Spirit. So I've been making the case now and last week that we should pray for a fresh visitation of the Holy Spirit. That uh, that's, that's primary. We need to really be at that. I, and I believe that with all my heart. And I'm, I'm seeking to uh, exercise that myself and do that. So now I'm going to try to talk you out of it. <laughs> well, I'm not actually going to try to talk to you. I'm going to warn you about it. I'm going to warn you about it. Because first, you see, the Holy Spirit shows up. All that stuff, sweet, love and joy and peace and drama. First, he will bring conviction. First, he will bring conviction. Now, the other reading, which I, I, 
I was almost going to read before the sermon, but I'm just going to read it now uh, that I read at the other churches. It's John 16. Now, in John, there's three chapters in, in the Gospel of John where Jesus basically, uh, in these chapters, tells us what it's going to be like and what the Holy Spirit's job is and what he will do. So listen to this. He says, Jesus says, unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. That's the Holy Spirit, the counselor. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands judged. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he goes on. So here are three unpleasant words in the ears of modern Western people. Sin, righteousness, judgment. Okay? We don't like those words. Our, our world doesn't like those words. Sin? Who ever uses the word anymore? Can you imagine going to, say, Johnny got in trouble at school and you're the young parent and you go to the school and the, they call you to the principal's office and you go down there and the principal says, Johnny, he's been sinning a lot. <laughs> Somehow I don't think that's going to happen. You know? Sin, which is a common word, there's a bunch of words for it in, in, in Scripture, you know, it's just something that's a lo largely excused away. Um, righteousness, ooh. Well, as soon as you hear that, I think people think self-righteousness. We we're not really ac acquainted with righteousness as much, but we hear a lot about self-righteousness. We don't like it. Judgment, ooh, kind of sounds like judgmental. We don't like that either. <laughs> so now this is an uphill climb, isn't it? The thing is, Jesus says the Holy Spirit's job, his work, is to bring evidence to our hearts, to our consciences, until we come to be convinced, or to be convicted, if you will, about sin and righteousness and judgment. So the picture here is like a courtroom. The Holy Spirit is the prosecuting attorney, right? And uh, he is, we are the, our, our hearts or our consciences, if you will, are the jury. So the Holy Spirit's trotting out the evidence and he, until he gets a conviction, whether it takes 120 days or whether it takes years, he just keeps doing it. And this is, this, is a com this is my experience in life. I find this is what the Holy Spirit has been working on for lo these 61 plus years in my heart and life. He's trotting out the evidence so that I may come to conviction. See, sin matters. Christ died for our sins. If it doesn't matter to us as Christians, what's the point? I mean, the bedrock foundational teaching is that Jesus Christ died on a cross. In fact, that's the sign of our, uh, you know, of our faith is the cross in order that we might be forgiven for our sins. The choir just sang beautifully, you know, was it Jesus keep me near the cross? Because you know, that's, that's what we've come to know that we, we, we sense a need of. And sin stands in the way of the things that we really want. We, sin stands in the way of peace and it stands in the way of joy and it definitely stands in the way of love. And it takes all kinds of forms. Now, I'm not going to get too into this because over the years I've experienced when I start to talk about sin, people get depressed. <laughs> and when they get depressed, I lose their attention. So, this, you know, there's no point. So just, but <laughs> sin ranges everywhere from violence and, you know, horrible, abusive, genocidal nonsense, which is way too common in the human race, all the way through to, you know, the thoughts we think that we shouldn't be thinking that are, you know, that are... Uh, so self-centered or so greedy or, or so arrogant or, or whatever. It's, it's all, all of that. But Jesus, Jesus says, in regard to sin, because people do not believe in me. Pretty wild. So the example Jesus uses about, of sin, it's kind of the preeminent example. He says, well, it's because they, I, the Holy Spirit's going to convince them about sin because they don't believe in me. That's a bit of a head-scratcher. Except that at the end of the day, that's the main thing that you want to not do, <laughs> is not believe in Jesus. Because no matter how many, what our sins are, how wrecked up we are as human beings, when we come to Christ and put our trust in him and believe in him, he will take that sin away. 
And he will heal us, and he will transform us, and he will fill us with the Holy Spirit. And, and at, at the, the root thing that stops people from believing in Jesus is just, you know, arrogance, and it's this sense of independence and rugged, uh, you know, self-sufficiency and uh, hard-heartedness. That is sin. People, you know, the, the remedy that the Holy Spirit's working on in the lives of the world, you know, is that they would come to put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness matters. It matters. We don't really know what it looks like, except as we have seen it in Jesus. That's where we see what righteousness is. What good, and it's not self-righteousness. Jesus had no, there was no self-righteousness in him at all. This is why I wish people, hope people will read and study the Gospels. You've got to let your mind kind of focus on the person of Jesus and the things he did. And then you will see what righteousness is, what goodness really is. Because everything he did was, he was full of joy, he was full of humility, he was full of care for others, self, you know, selflessness and uh, uh, servanthood heart. He, he, he spoke the truth plainly in love and protected the weak. I mean, everything he did was, was love, especially uh, the cross. So that's, that's righteousness. And so he, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit's going to convince you of righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see, won't see me any longer. He's not here for us to look at. The disciples had him for a few years. We don't. And in his place... We have the Holy Spirit who teaches us what righteousness is and convinces us, convinces us of what it is. It's, no, it's not that, it's this. And by golly, it'll always be something that's like Jesus. Right? Judgment matters. We will all give account for our lives before God. We will all give account for our lives. What we've said, what we've done, how we spend our time before God. Now, that, it may be so, well, that's really Old Testament. Yep, and New Testament. <laughs> I, 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 talk about, I don't have time to talk about it now. I can see I'm losing you. <laughs> see, I know this, but I just go carry on anyway. <laughs> you need to hear. Thanks, Sue. Um, I, I just read a book by Jim Cimbala who talked, he, he said, I'm going to tell you a, a good answer for that question. You know, people get really hung up in the Old Testament. It's got a lot of weird stuff in there. And a lot of cruel stuff in there, a lot of violent stuff in there. A lot of, and what about all those rules they got in there that we don't do and don't keep? <laughs> what's, what's wrong? It, so he says, basically, he says, everything, all, this, all that stuff in the Old Testament, unless it's reiterated in the New Testament, doesn't apply to us. I thought, ooh, that's pretty good. <laughs> so, I mean, so obviously, we don't, we're not supposed to go around sacrificing cows and sheep and spreading their blood all over the place. Yay. And, you know, all, the nine, all, all nine of the Ten Commandments are reiterated in the New Testament. The only one that isn't is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Interesting. How many of us are taking it Saturday off? That's the Sabbath day, by the way. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, and because there's a new definition in the New Testament, it says once you've come to Christ, you've entered God's Sabbath. You've entered his rest. We're in his rest in Christ. So it's a whole theological thing here. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. But, but judgment definitely carries through in the New Testament. Jesus talks about judgment a lot. He talks about the sheep and the goats, and one's at his left hand and one's at his right. Paul says, we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to make answer for the things that we've done in the body. Straight out there. <clears throat> that knowledge changes how you live. People, you look around the world and say, how do these people get away with this stuff? Guess what? Nobody's getting away with anything. <laughs> Maybe in this world, because this world's justice is very poor, very incomplete, right? Very, very weak. But, but God's justice is perfect. It's another reason we need the cross and the blood of Christ that covers us. When, when we come to that day of accounting, you need to plead the blood of Jesus, the cross of Christ. It's the only answer. And then Jesus just says, because the ruler of this world now stands judged. Which is kind of a, another peculiar thing that Jesus said. He, you know, the ruler of the world is judged. He's talking about Satan, actually. I oh, won't go there today. So Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. 
He says, he will guide you into all truth. Boy, do we ever need to hear the truth today. And it's so confusing. You ever watch the news? There's fake news out there. <laughs> what's real? What's true? There's so much spin. People with political interests, they spin things. And, you know, oh, man, frustrating. So how sweet it is that the Holy Spirit will never, ever lie to you. He always speaks the truth if you want to hear it. So we have to decide whether we want the truth, whether we can handle the truth, whether we want conviction. If so, we indeed need to pray for the Holy Spirit to come, to convict, to indwell, and to empower us, and to turn our hearts to Jesus the Savior. Let us pray.